Like the British, the Russians have long enjoyed a nice cup of tea. Properly prepared, of course. Sergei, yes. this is a samovar. Yes, it's traditional Russian samovar. How does it work? Does it make the tea? Essentially, we can say that the Russian samovar is boiling water. So, uh, here we can say middle shaft. Is that where the water goes in? No, no, no. Here we can put hot coals. Hot coals, okay. Yes, and here is water. All around her. Oh, I yes. see. Water is boiling. Yeah. We turn this detail. And here, tea brew. Voila. I see, to keep it warm. Then we do it. So tea. you pour first? Yes, yes, strong tea, very strong. First strong tea. And then hot, hot water. water. Yeah. I understand. And then do you put in the milk? No, no, only lemon. Only lemon? Only lemon, yes. Okay. And is it very strong? Uh, yes, yes, Russian tea is very strong because Russian people are very strong. Oh. Strong tea, strong people. I understand. Russia. For Mother Russia. <laughs> yes. It's quite strong. Yes. It's <laughs> <people. laughs>
as well as public events, these gifts celebrated more personal family matters. This lily of the valley egg, covered in rose gold and pearls, was styled after the Tsarina's favorite flower. What's the surprise with this one? Uh, the surprise of this one is three portraits of uh, Nicholas II and two daughters, Tatiana and Olga. Does it pop up like this? Yes, but not pop. It softly slides off. Mm. Yes, yes, you have to turn the knob yeah. and it slides off like magically. I think it's very poignant that after the revolution, Fabergé had not been paid for his egg, so he sent the bill, not to Emperor Nicholas, but to Mr. Nicholas Romanov. He wasn't uh, his majesty or he wasn't the emperor, so the only way to, uh, to ask him was Mr. Yeah. in the Tsar's Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, there's a hidden piece of royal vandalism, which captures a moment in time for Alexandra, wife of Nicholas II and the last Russian empress. Up here, there's a little record of exactly what Alexandra was doing on the 17th of March, 1902. She was watching her husband through this window. Nikki, it says, looking at the Hussars. Although well, I think that she'd climbed up on something to rise it, because that's really too high to reach. Alexandra often used English at home, as she'd grown up at the court of her grandmother, Queen Victoria. And this English note was carved with what was closest to hand, a diamond ring. Tsars have always had to balance two roles. On one hand, the stern commander, and on the other, the little father. To the outside observer, Nicholas I appeared to be every inch the unflinching autocrat. But here, at his summer residence at Peterhof, he tried to show his softer side. Nicholas embraced family life and constructed a suburban-style villa where he put on rather stilted performances of domestic life. In a rather bizarre ritual, Nicholas and his family would act out their domestic happiness outside the cottage each July. They'd take tea in front of a whole crowd of onlookers. These people would be carefully vetted members of the public or selected peasants from their estates. And we're told that they'd stand and watch in silent devotion. The Empress will be making the tea and Nicholas himself will go down and make small talk with the so-called insignificant people. And then with a theatrical flourish, he'd invite a member of the crowd to come up and have tea with the royal family. Sadly, the Tsar's broken relationship with his people couldn't simply be fixed over a cup of tea 